Okay. The future is mobile. I work for Titus Learning, uh, and we're based in UNESCO World Heritage Site of Salts Mill in Yorkshire in the UK. Uh, we're based in this beautiful building. In fact, I have the good fortune uh, to normally be working in the former office of Sir Titus Salt. Uh, he put this beautiful building together. Sadly, he didn't do excellent provision for Wi-Fi, but we've sorted that out now. And the thing about Sir Titus Salt, he was an entrepreneur uh, and a philanthropist. He made his money in Salt Mill in the 1850s by importing Peruvian alpaca wool uh, and weaving it into fabric and selling it and exporting it. And he built a modern village next to, just here, next to a salt mill. And he was, uh, he built uh, an institute of education and a library in order to uh, help the education of the ordinary workers. And Seven Mike, who founded uh, Titus Learning saw that as an inspiration uh, in order to, and Moodle and uh, educational top software was their way of emulating Sir Titus Salt and, and making uh, education, improving education for people. Um, so who am I? Uh, Elton as well introduced me rather. I'm a senior developer based in Yorkshire in the UK. I am a qualified teacher with 12 years experience uh, in the classroom, or at the chalk face as some people call it, although I'm very proud to say that in 12 years, I, don't, I think I wrote on a whiteboard once. Uh, and I've been developing quiz code since the late 1990s, uh, which that's even before the dawn of Moodle time. So I've been very focused on this for a very long time. And I'm, I'm greatly honoured to be here today because uh, in my uh, 20s, it was my ambition to come to Japan. And this ambition, in my early 20s, uh, I, I bought a copy of this book. <laughs> Jobs in Japan by John Wharton. And in fact, it's a fairly homemade book. Uh, the illustrations are by Liz Wharton. I think they may know each other. And the great promise was to go to Japan, teach English, uh, learn about this fascinating country, and make it quite, quite a good living. So in 1987, having been inspired by this book, uh, I set off uh, for Japan. I set off for Japan the long way via the United States. I traveled around the United States. Then I went on to Australia. And that's the young me. I was that young once, and that's 1987. But last year, yes. But I got rather distracted by Australia. In fact, I got very distracted, and I stayed there for the next seven years. Uh, and and uh, somebody persuaded me to uh, take a, a real job there. Uh, so I never got to, to Japan. And my partner, Sarah, is here today, would, would have told you that. that I had a certain regret about this, and I really enjoyed the fact that I spent all this time in Australia. There was always this thing in the back of my head where I wish I'd wanted at least to visit Japan, if not stayed and worked here. So that when I was invited to come to present today, uh, I was absolutely thrilled, and I'd like to say, uh, give my great thanks to the Moodle Association of Japan for making my visit here uh, to this moot possible. So thank you very much. So this is what I'm going to talk about. Why should you care about mobile? What is the Moodle mobile app? And why the gap-filled question type, my question type, matters? I'm slightly biased, perhaps, but I think you'll agree that it is a significant contribution, particularly if you're teaching language. Mobile is the future. That's my prediction. But predictions are always difficult. 
and especially when they're about the future. And Thomas Edison, quite a smart guy, but he wasn't correct with this prediction. I like this prediction, I like it a lot. Um, it suggests that there will be more smartphones than humans by 2021. Uh, and I've seen a lot of uh, predictions and projections about smartphone usage. Um, and the smartphone is becoming ubiquitous. There's vast numbers of them. There'll be about 7 billion people, and that suggests there's going to be more than 7 billion smartphones, not just phones, but smartphones. And I brought a reminder with me um, to what degree technology, technology has changed since that photograph of me when I first visited Japan. I brought along an example of a smartphone from when I, uh, when I was first in Australia all those years ago. <laughs> I, I'm, I've tried, but I, I can't get the Moodle mobile app to run on this. Um, so there's vast numbers of smartphones, but there's also vast numbers of televisions and radios and electric toothbrushes, and they are probably not going to make that much difference to education. And cons I, I recommend, if anybody thinks you're taking notes, uh, that earlier screenshot was taken from the website of somebody called Audrey Watters. And she has a blog called The History of the Future of Education Technology. And what it is, is about all the predictions that have been made in the past about all the technologies that are going to radically transform uh, education. We're going to uh, engineer away teachers. You won't need teachers anymore because you'll have wax audio discs and you'll just listen to these uh, great people talking or you're going to have video cassettes or you're going to remember the rise of the DVD. Thank you, Mr. Gates. Beautiful. Remember Encarta? Anybody bought a copy of Encarta recently? Yeah, a thing called Wikipedia came along. Free. Can't possibly work. Anybody can edit it. So yes, so why is a mobile phone going to be different from all these other technologies, and why am I constantly predicting uh, Did it work? It's, it's going to be different with a mobile phone than it is with other technologies. And the bottom line, it's about a personalization. The fact your mobile phone is so very, very personal. And I'm now going to uh, ask you con to conduct a thought experiment, marvelous thing thought experiment. They don't require any equipment or setup or funding. Okay. Why mobile is different? I want you to think now of everything that you own. Think, wherever you live, think of everything that you own. Put a little icon of a house in there. Does that translate culturally? Does it look a house? Doesn't that look unusually Japanese? We have to cross cultural barriers. Think about everything you own, or think about first thing in the morning when you're about to leave your home. And then think about. What is it that you consider that you'll take with you in your car or about the personage or in your bag or in your handbag? Obviously, there are some things you won't think about taking with you, such as your fridge and your cooker and your Hoover, perhaps. But all the things that you might take with you. And then think of all the things that you really do carry with you. Perhaps your keys, your wallet, maybe your mobile phone. And then all of the things that you carry with you and you definitely use. And of course, it's simply your mobile phone. Personally, if I leave the house and get to the train station, which is not too far away, and I've left my mobile phone and my train's about to leave the station, is it a question? I turn around and go back and get my mobile phone. Your mobile phone is your life in your hand or your pocket. It's your diary, your calendar, your gossip, perhaps, through social networking. Maybe it's your payments. I'm a bit of a lot. I don't have any payments through it. Uh, your voice, your traditional telephony, your photos. You use it everywhere. You use it at home, at work, in the car, in bed, and apparently some people in the toilet. Okay, it, it's, it's, it's more personal, I believe, than any other piece of technology. Uh, remember that picture of me in the 1980s? That was the time of the big phone and the Filofax. And for some people, their Filofax was their life in that little leather and... But, the mobile phone is more personal than that. Far more personal. Par partly, I think, because it's effectively automatically... Concentrate! Concentrate! 
is one of the most useless things that teachers say. <laughs> I have a problem with concentration. I'll tell you a personal story. At the age of about 45, I, I started having very strange and slightly alarming um, symptoms, and I, I ended up going to hospital, and they attached electrodes to me and observed me. Eventually, the diagnosis, bizarre, bizarrely, was Tourette's, and not the sweary version, although I used to say that perhaps I might swear at my students and use that as a doctor to let me off, but it's strange movements and ticks. But one of the interesting things about having Tourette's and developing in later life for a teacher, as I was, is that the symptoms only kick in at the edge of my concentration. So I have this very physical demonstration of what I am, when I, I find it hard to fake not paying attention, which is a good reason for me not to be a student. Uh, and teachers, all throughout my life as a young person, concentrate, concentrate. And really the word concentrate, said to students, really means something dull is about to happen. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? So, but nobody ever learns anything without concentrating. Do you remember those sort of predictions you'd have sometimes, and you'd go, oh, you fall asleep with a, a speaker under your pillow, and you learn to play Mozart on the piano, and you see, you know, you're young, and you think, oh, that's exciting, and then you think for another 10 seconds, and you're not making this up. Nobody learns anything without concentrating, and if you can find a way or a thing that people will concentrate on and put the activities in your learning there, then, oh, oh dear, dear me. Looking this, I, anybody who's in a, teach, a teacher in this room will be thinking right now, rookie mistake, he turned his back on them. Nobody in this room is thinking, this student is just looking up what he put on the board and almost just to check the veracity. Maybe you're not thinking that, are you? You're all thinking, oh, they're about to go on a social networking site. This student, instead of concentrating on the teacher, is concentrating on the mobile device because this is the thing that people concentrate on constantly, all of the time. And nobody ever learns anything without concentrating. So Moodle, for years, had uh, adaptive themes that would change the way things were laid out uh, to look good on mobile devices. But there was clearly a need for uh, a mobile app Drum roll, fanfare of trumpets in the year 2005, and the mobile app for Moodle, Moodle arrived, and it's a standard thing you can download from the Apple App Store or the Google Play, and you install it on your mobile phone, and lo, it was good. Ish. He's looking nervously over at Martin there. It was good. It really was good. <laughs> However, for me, it really kicked in in 2018 with Moodle 3.5, and I call this the developer's friend, because the mobile app had been updated and updated, and, and it supported all core Moodle activities uh, from a student's perspective. And when I say from a student's perspective, that means that you could work your way through the resources and activities. Uh, it wasn't set up to allow teachers to create things, so the teacher couldn't, for example, create a, a new quiz, but I kind of think a mobile device is probably isn't, that's not the right platform for that. The important thing is students could uh, use it for all activities. But in 2018, version 3.5, the developer's friend, it became much easier to add support for plugins. And Core Moodle is lovely. It's lovely, 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 lovely. But I have never seen a real world Moodle site that doesn't have at least some plugins. Okay, uh, even Moodle's Moodle Cloud has some additional plugins, such as, for example, uh, Big Blue Button. Okay, so plugins are essential. So last year, middle of last year, 3.5 improved plugin support, and it really was significantly improved. You could adapt your plugins without having to write JavaScript in some cases. You didn't have to, a local site that, that emulated on your local computer. Uh, and I've been a developer of, uh, of plugins prior to this. And this just made life a lot easier. So, fantastic. We've got, now got plug-in support. So, all the activities, all resources, is optimised for small screens, as you'd expect. And really, this is really interesting, and I'm not sure how many people here will have tried this, uh, offline or synchronised support. In other words, with a mobile app, this is one of the things that differentiates it 
from using the web browser. The standard uh, is that you can uh, use it when you haven't got an internet connection. And this was highlighted for me. It was Elton Leclerc here contacted me about modifying my uh, question type to work with the mobile app. And he highlighted there was a story where there was people weren't able to get on the, the internet. And he realized that ha what a huge problem that was. And if they could download the content and work with that connectivity, um, that would increase the chance of people actually use it. Of course, it's really useful, um, although Wi-Fi is becoming ubiquitous, but there's always something. You're on a train, you're in far away in the countryside, where you don't have any connectivity. It's really useful. And if you haven't used it previously, uh, this is how you go about it. You, you can download your course content, you can work as if you're connected, and then you can synchronize when you're next connected. And the way to demonstrate this to yourself is to put your mobile device into airplane mode, because you really know you don't have any connectivity then. And um, I find this to be somewhat akin to magic. Any advanced, sufficiently advanced technology might as well be magic, I think. Um, and I did this thing recently whereby I went into a forum in airplane mode and posted a message. And then I reconnected, turned it on, and then it appeared without me doing anything else. You know, in the background, it did the synchronization. So uh, that's a marvelous feature. So these are just a few screenshots if you've never seen it previously of how you do this download course contents and synchronization. So you get this little <coughs> cloud icon here, and you click on that, and it whirs around a little bit, and it uh, downloads the content. <coughs> Every so often I try this with the Moodle Law forums, but there's approximately a bajillion forum posts, so it takes quite a long time to, to download that. Um, there are limitations. My particular area is uh, uh, quiz and question types. Uh, one of the really frustrating things is, is that offline mode is disabled by default and you have to go and find it. And in the notes for this, I've got a quote from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy about the clearly available planning permissions that were in the basement uh, in the sign in a, in, a, in a filing cabinet with a sign on it saying beware of the leopard. This really is quite hidden. And because of that, I'm going to show you exactly how you get to uh, turn on offline quiz attempts. And there are some limitations. It won't work with interactive behaviours. In other words, uh, the marking happens when you reconnect. Uh, and, the, and part of the reason for that is, is that um, it, if it downloaded the correct answers while you were offline, in theory, the students would then be able to use some ninja magic to uh, find out the right answers. Now, I know that's true, but I, as a teacher, I've had this odd idea that I want learning technology to be about learning rather than testing. Maybe it's just me, maybe it's an eccentricity. And I would love a mode whereby you could skip a switch and it gave a warning to say that real clever people here might be able to work around this, but hey, you get to learn something. But that's just me. Um, and there are some other very slight incompatibilities that I don't think it would affect many people much of the time. So, this is how you. <coughs> Uh, switch on offline mode for quizzes. So you go into where your quiz editing is, you go down to the little thing that says extra restrictions on attempts, you click on show more, and you'll see a little dialog there that says uh, allow quiz to be attempted offline using the mobile app. I'm just going to show you my notes for this because I can't remember the exact. Ah, oh, it's a shame it doesn't include the uh, quote from the Hitchhiker's Guide. I thought it did there. So, um, so remember I was saying that uh, I'm very keen on learning. Same thing particularly. Uh, I'm not very keen on exams. In the UK, <clears throat> we've got a dog, and we've got a tail, and in this scenario. The tail wags the dog. The exams drive the learning curricula. And I did a bit of a search on emotions associated with exams, and, and like most Google users, I just picked the first thing that came back. 
And it came back with these items out of 15 bajillion. Optimism, I got a whole three weeks left. Anxiety. Constant worry. Paranoia. Boredom and procrastination. A cleaning urge. And I'm not sure how famous Gordon Ramsay is here. Is it a familiar figure? He's a celebrity chef. And he's sweaty. Uh, and I think this is all about... Uh, uh, you decide you're going to cook a fabulous gourmet meal just to put up the whole business of exams and denial. And my point of this is, is that exams are a huge source <coughs> of anxiety. The people don't like exams. They disagree with me. I mean, Japan is a very different culture. Perhaps Japanese people absolutely love exams. <laughs> Look forward to it. It's very exciting. It's universal. Not many things are universal, but people don't like exams. I'm going to tell you a true story from my own experience as a teacher for uh, 12 years in the UK FE sector. At the beginning of term, and the first lesson, I would go into my class and I'd say, this is, I'm Marcus, just so they think I was. Uh, at the end of the lesson, there will be a short quiz, 10 questions. It doesn't contribute to the grade at the end of the year, just a little quiz. It'd be not very difficult. And every year, <laughs> what a quiz, oh no, a new quiz. <laughs> it's just ten questions, it won't take you very long. You can take it as many times as you like. Um, don't worry about it. <laughs> week two, maybe week three, there'll be a short ten question quiz at the end of the lesson. All oh, right, great, terrific. Classic thing from this is, you can, and I'd say you can take it as many times as you like. And one or other student, sooner or later, would say, I've uh, only got nine out of ten, can I do it again? I'd say, you can shoot as many times as you like. And then they'd say, isn't that cheating? And I'd say, you can think of this cheating, I'll try to think of this learning, but no, you have your own perspective. <laughs> and then by about week, uh, say by about week five, the way our teacher workload was structured, by about week five, often some of the other courses had kicked in and, I had, and people had submitted homework and I was having to do some marking and I was under time pressure that eventually made me stop being a teacher. And um, I'd go to a lesson and I hadn't prepared a quiz. And the students would say, we've got a quiz this week. I'd say, I'm sorry, I haven't prepared one. Oh, no, no, quiz, work for the quiz. <laughs> My point is, is that people like quizzes. They don't like exams. In fact, People like quizzes so much that the most common use of the word quiz in the UK, and I think possibly in the English-speaking language, is to put the word pub before it. <laughs> okay? Uh, if you're running a pub or a bar, and you decide you want to get some more customers in, you could put a, an A-frame, a notice outside, saying, tonight, quiz. <laughs> tonight, pub exam. <laughs> it's not going to work, is it? It's not going to work. They'll think, oh, is it hygiene inspection? I'm like, oh, what is it? No, no. Instead, you put up a sign saying, uh, I'm quiz. And it's super terrific. Um, also, quizzes, it's the most popular TV format. Uh, and, and people watch them. And, and producers like them because they're fairly cheap. You just get three or six people and a quiz master. But people like quizzes. And here's the great news. Moodle has the best quiz engine, in existence, free, all paid for, bar nothing, and I'll fight anybody who says anything different. I wouldn't really, I'd run away, I'm a coward. But it does. It's, got the, it's, it's very, very powerful. It's got huge amounts of options. So... If the Moodle quiz is so good, how come I've spent about 10 years of my life making new quiz questions? Question types. Um, and there's a saying amongst programmers that oftentimes uh, programmers start their own projects to scratch an itch. They have a problem that they want to address. Okay? And my itch was the core Moodle closed question type. Now, it pains me to criticise Moodle in any way, especially when Martin Dugianas is in the audience. 
And when I first discovered the quiz and close, I thought it's brilliant. Because I've written my own fill in the blanks question types, and they've got a fill in the blank question. It's ex excellent. And I looked at it, and I thought, oh, it looks, it looks a bit tricky, a little bit hard. But I'm a computer programmer. I think I'm quite clever. I think it's really clever. How hard could it be? The answer to that question is really quite hard. Hmm. I call this the clothes monster. And this is taken from the examples. The, uh, actually, if I go back one, I just skipped over a slide. This is what it looks like when you take this example. It says, match the following cities with the correct state. So you have to know that San Francisco is in the United States state of California, not Arizona. And if you choose Arizona, it gives you a cross there. That's true. And it can also give you some feedback. And to create this question, uh, this is the syntax that is, that is required. Uh, and I've counted the items of syntax at eight. You've got a curly brace, a thing, one of those, we've got one of those, we've got that, the actual text, we've got that. Eight things you've got to learn. But still, that doesn't seem too oppressive, does it? Eight things. I'm a computer programmer, I can learn that. Unfortunately, it's very, very picky. And each one of those is incorrect. And I'll just explain why one of them is incorrect. One of them is incorrect. I'll explain one. And this one. The reason that's incorrect is, is that the word multi-choice is lowercase. Oh, life's too short. Life's too short. So this was my itch. It was a real burning itch. It was, oh, that's really cool. So I decided to create a new question. And I called it gas fill, and I wanted to make it very easy for teachers to learn. So easy that I had to print the instructions on drool-proof paper. And in order to learn to use this question type, you would need to learn one seven-word sentence to create basic questions. Okay? One seven-word question. One seven-word one seven word sentence. You can do that. One seven-word sentence. I'll count out the words with my fingers. Are you ready? Because I love this book, by the way. I recommend this book. It's called Don't Make Me Think. Nobody wants to think more than strictly necessary. It's not just the idle students, not the lazy students. Lazy is such an unhelpful word. Because nobody wants to think more than strictly necessary. Here we go. Put square braces around the missing words. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Put square braces around the missing words. So, if you wanted people to know that the word you typed in there was sat, you put square braces around the word sat. And if there are any mathematicians in the room, it doesn't have to be square braces. You can change them. It's in the settings. But for everybody else, we'll use square braces. And if you do that, this is what it looks like for a student. The cat's up on the map, you've got a blank there, and you, that's the way it works. So, uh, how many bits of syntax do you need to learn for that? Okay, We've got the opening brace. We've got the closing brace. Two items of syntax seem to be quite enough. But my guiding principle was no more, no more syntax. That's enough. 2012, no more syntax. Everything else you're going to uh, put in form field. There's a way of doing it with one item of syntax, but it doesn't want to seem too clever. OK. So I'm now going to do that one from close. Match the following cities with the correct state. Correct answer is California. Incorrect answer you put down here in Arizona. You can have multiple incorrect answers if you like. You just put a comma between them. But if you want to give them some feedback, you can click a button, it highlights all the gaps. And you click on a gap and it pops up a form that allows you to enter the response you will get for a correct answer and an incorrect answer. And you can also put URLs in there so people can click to find out more. And that's how it'll appear. The uh, answer for correct, or the feedback for correct or incorrect will be shown immediately after the gap in the body of the text, okay? It's there, next to the words, not below, anything like that. Uh, and you can include clickable URLs. Those of you who aren't currently using it, you already want to use it, haven't you? That's cool. So easy. Right. 
Now, that's nice, and it's available under the GPL, but I'm going to offer you two for the price of one. It's already free, so you can get two for the price of one. So that's two times no money. What you can do is you can create a second harder question with only four mouse clicks, and that includes the save click. And what this involves is duplicating the question and changing one of the settings. I'm going to show you the screenshots for that. Here we go. So in the question bank, you click on there for duplicate. You go into the uh, editing form and you change it from the default of drag and drop to gap fill. And what you end up with is the original quite difficult question, the quite relatively easy question with a draggable prompt, and this other one where you type it in, it doesn't give any prompts. There you go, two for the price of one. I'd like to offer you a set of free steak knives as well, but I can't get them for nothing. Okay, so I'm, what I was saying was this is very, very easy to use, but you might be thinking, oh, is it just easy to use to create trivial questions? You know, is it, is it feature light? No, it's got some, you can do some things in it that you can't do in any other question type. And these include category questions, automatically generated hints, sneaky blanks, correct blanks, and also crosswords. So, I love this, I love this, this is category questions. In order to answer this, you have to know that you have to drag that a, a lion is feline, a tiger is feline, a dog is canine, a wolf is canine, and a rabbit is neither feline nor canine. Okay? Now, to do that, you have to know how to create the HTML tables. But that's not too hard, is it? Although, it wouldn't be easier for some kind of wizard to do this. Well, if you'd like to approach me, uh, make me an offer, um, I'm willing to develop such a thing. Or Titus Learning will, anyway. If you wait long enough, I might do it anyway. <laughs> but it might be quite a wait. Uh, now, automatic hints. I've got to thank uh, Elton for this. Uh, there's a, a setting in the question editor, the uh, question editing, when you check on and off, it's off by default, called letter hints. The thing is, is that when you're giving students questions, it's lovely if, if they can have more than one attempt at them. Uh, that way, uh, they get to um, you know, a second go. And the nice thing for teachers is if they have multiple attempts, you can sometimes it's a good way of judging the depths of their ignorance of the subject. Because um, if they just get the answer incorrect the first go, it might be, oh, they just weren't concentrating. But if they've attempted a question three times and got it wrong three times, they really don't know the answer. So this is what happens. If you see this last item here, it says the longest river in England is the River Thames. It's not. But most, you know, if you're not from the UK, it's probably the only river in the UK that you know about. So uh, this student has touched the River Thames. It's incorrect. When they press, press try again, it maintained the correct answers, but it put in the first letter of the correct answer there. And if you press it again, it'll come the next letter, and the next letter, and the next letter. And the nice thing about this is you don't have to think the clues up, because thinking clues is hard enough just thinking of questions, but thinking of clues is, is extra hard. And so this is effectively, this is, this is automatically created hints, or letter hints, as I call it. Now, remember me using the word uh, sneaky a little while ago? Just take a look at that. Take a look at the question. So, a cat is feline. A dog is canine. A mouse is none of them. None of them. Now, this is a bit bad, isn't it? You should, if you're being all sort of um, educational theorists, and this is going to test the rigor of your students' understanding, they have to be absolutely confident. Are oh, you just being sneaky? I haven't had any feedback on this, whether or not I should have never developed it. It's like you know, developing some dangerous tool that teachers will go out there and use and frustrate students, but it was relatively easy to develop. So that's, uh, that's uh, correct blanks. Crosswords. I should have had two slides here. I should have had one slide with the answers not in there, 
and another slide with the answers in there. But here you go. Again, you have to be familiar with creating HTML tables, but that's outside the scope of um, the syntax. And I can really imagine somebody approaching me and asking me to build a wizard for this. Or people being very patient and waiting for me to get around to building a wizard for it. One of the really uh, nice things about Gatfield is Gatfield has got a lovely sister. Lovely, lovely, lovely. And Gatfield's lovely sister is called Word Select. Word Select is a very easy to use question type. In fact, all you need to learn in order to know how to use Gatfield is one seven word sentence. You could have predicted that, couldn't you? It's a very slightly different uh, seven word sentence. It says, Put square braces around the correct word. Put square braces around the correct word. So, the cat's stuck on the map. It looks like the same thing, but it's not because this is how it appears at runtime. It's just text. What's it all about? Select the verb, which is the verb in that sentence. <laughs> so, you click on the word sat. It says, yeah, that's correct. And if you clicked on the matter word, it wasn't sat, it put a little X next to it. Now, those of you with extensive teaching experience will be thinking right at this moment, my students are just going to click on all the words, aren't they? They're just clicking one of them's bound to be right. It would, wouldn't they? It has a marking scheme built into it so that, uh, by default, for every incorrect selection, it takes a mark off from the correct selection all the way down to zero, okay? So that mitigates against it. But a while ago, somebody contacted me and said that they found, their students found it very frustrating because they get several right answers and they get nothing. And so now it's been modified so you can decide how much of a penalty there is for each of the incorrect selections. Okay, so that's Gatfield's sister, word select. Available from the, these two question types are available from the Moodle or plugins download. Um, uh, uh, Gapfill is, uh, is on about 1,900 sites, but uh, the statistics from Moodle Org, they're a bit unreliable because they massively underestimate. Massively underestimate. It's on loads more sites. Okay, here's an example of word select in a more practical thing that doesn't refer to domestic felines and their comfort requirements. So, uh, as you can see here, it says, the first question is, what was the year of Shakespeare's birth? And your students might look there and see there's, there's more than one date. So if they could understand that, they go, well, we've got two dates. But what they need to be able to understand in English is that the term, the year of birth, means the same as was born in. Okay? So that's like a, a comprehension question um, using word select. Okay? Right, I believe there are six animals in this word select question. Okay? And I want you to look at it and shout out the animals when you see them. Horse. Cat, dog, cow, horse. I know there's at least one more. It's a small creature of the insect styling. Ants. I think there's an Aussie Australian one in there. Martin, there's a uniquely Australian... Uh, kangaroo. Isn't it a kangaroo? Can you s you can't spot it. No, it's a flightless bird. He didn't spot it. It's the only one he didn't know. Yes! There's an emu on there. I had a friend in Australia we called emu because they had a very big... There you go. Okay, so, again, to do this, you've got to create HTML tables, but... Uh, the only magic in it is you put the square braces around the correct letters. So that's my last example of word select. And now what you might be thinking, well, this is quite a nice tool, and I wouldn't mind using it, um, but every time you get a new tool you've got to, that allows you to create content, you've got to create content. Between word select and gap fill, it ships with over 400 teaching English and foreign language sample questions that I've created. 
And in my workshop yesterday, we were playing with these, we were going through them. Uh, I created them because I, I needed a subject uh, to create questions on. I thought, well, what do I know quite a lot about? I thought, I speak English. Other people want to speak English. So I've created these questions and I've put, put them into categories. You can see here, objective order, articles, and all this kind of stuff, right? Uh, and they're free for reuse, modification, pick your very free license, um, DPL, Creative Commons, you know, I want people to take these away and use them. If you love them and you change them and you see the limitations, I'd love feedback and I'll incorporate them in future releases. But these are available in a folder in the installation directory when you install these. Now, remember the Moodle version 3.5 and it brought out uh, the mobile support, a beautiful, beautiful release of Moodle. It also brought out the ability to search quest, quiz questions on tags. For years, you could tag questions, and that was it. You couldn't search by tags. And I think tagging things is, by itself, just virtuous. One should tag things. If you can't then search by them, it's like, what's the point? But now you can, you can search, fantastic. And you can see here, these, this is a taxonomy I've used. I put in the name of the question type, uh, the, the area it covers, its tenses, and all this kind of stuff. And those questions, those approximately 400 questions, are pre-tagged. You may look at them and think they're the wrong tags, uh, but they, they, they're useful, I believe they're useful. And now I'm gonna talk about a core Moodle feature, which is the multi-language feature. Um, the idea is, is that, especially for language teaching, is that you, should, you can show different language according to the user's language that they've selected from their um, profile, okay? And this works with the Moodle mobile app. And I'll give you an example of this. This is John Smith, he's taking a quiz at the same time as Pierre, and Pierre is French, okay? And John Smith comes to this, and he speaks English as a first language, I don't know why he's doing this quiz, but there you go. And it tells him that he's gonna drag the verbs into the gaps. Okay, fair enough. Uh, the cat uh, horn the mat, no, the cat sat on the mat, and the cow hat, uh, no, they jumped over the moon. I just think these are terrible examples unless you're familiar with nursery rhymes. Uh, so there you go, that's the prompt. Pierre is taking the same exam at the same time, and this is what Pierre sees. And when I've been informed, this is the French for drag the birds into the gap. It should have been in Japan for this presentation, but I have no idea what it's saying. Okay? So to do this, in order to set this up, apart from turning on the filter which comes with core Moodle, you have to do a bit of uh, HTML jiggery poker and fiddling around with. So that is what you have to do. You have to put these tags in, which means you have to go into HTML edit mode. Um, also, you need to be careful that you don't put in any other tags between the opening closing of the span. And that, that's not nothing. That is, I think, potentially very useful for anybody teaching languages. Okay, coming towards the end now. Oh my god. I've got minus on a minute. Okay, uh, this is just a suggestion because, as I mentioned, I, 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 I'm quite interested in people learning things rather than testing people. And uh, the default question behavior in Moodle is a thing called deferred feedback, which means you don't find anything out about your responses until the end of the exam. And even in those little 10 question exams, by the time you submit at the end, you've forgotten about question one. Uh, but Moodle, for quite a long time, has supported interactive, so you get feedback straight away. So I strongly urge, if you can either persuade your admin person, or if you are the admin person, to change the default uh, quiz question behavior to interactive with multiple tries. Because the reality of human behavior is, is that people, they just use the default. People don't, don't make me think, don't make me think about Moodle settings, just give me some comfortable, useful ones. So I strongly urge you to change, and, and that is how you do it. I'll make these, uh, um, the idea is that students should, I want students to learn rather than being tested. Because the thing is, if they do learn, testing's gonna be easy, isn't it? Because they'll have learned the stuff. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, remember, remember how it used to be when I, when I was in Australia? 20 minutes battery life. Uh, we wouldn't have believed that mobile learning is going to happen. If it isn't happening for you already, I promise you it will. It is a safe prediction. The Moodle mobile app is very fully featured. It's regularly updated. Uh, I'm constantly talking to the guys who do it at Moodle HQ, and very smart people, and mainly based in, uh, in Barcelona. Um, 
and the gap full of word select question types are awesome. They're very, very easy to learn to use, and they are particularly useful if you're teaching languages. And I added this slide quite late into all of this because people born today, babies, will never use a landline. If you show them a landline, they think, oh, that's interesting. Last week we went to the museum and saw a horse buggy in with. Yes, they will never. And this, this is my great grandniece, was exactly. My great niece, and she was born just before Christmas. And you can see she's already a mobile user. Okay? And notice, concentrate! She is, she's concentrating on it. And you know what it's like trying to get babies to concentrate. And I added this picture right at the very end. And the, uh, at, at uh, midnight last night, I was speaking to a mum to say, Can I use this picture? And she said, Yes. And that's just a reminder that mobile really is the future. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Thank you for the translation, by the way. Thank you for uh, adding that. And does anybody have any questions?